following supervised learning, where we have labeled data points available for the training of our models, we now want to look at the case where we do not have any of these labels. If you have data, but you don't know what you want to label them individually, what else can you do with it? Imagine you are presented a number of different fruits that you have never seen or heard of before. Your task is now to differentiate them in a way that makes it easier to group new samples into a bucket of fruits that are similar to it. How will you approach this task? After some time to think about it, I guess you would try to look at obvious characteristics of the different fruits and group them together based on how similar they are to each other. For example, you might look at different color variations, size, shape, maybe even smell. At some point, you will also most likely make some decisions in terms of what is similar enough to be in the same bucket and what is different enough to form a new bucket. This whole idea of finding patterns within your dataset that describes your data to then form groups of similar items is called clustering. Clustering describes a big family of algorithms that follow the unsupervised learning paradigm. Clustering is usually used to categorize datasets into a number of clusters, whose number is most of the time unknown, and where clusters are groups of similar items. Those clusters are not known beforehand, as we do not have any labels, but they are very useful to automatically organize datasets and unseen data points. This can provide you some additional insights as part of your explorative data analysis. For instance, it could be used to identify groups of similar sounding songs in a large music collection. Clustering, however, is not the only algorithm class that can be used in unsupervised learning. Another very important family are algorithms used for dimensionality reduction. As we have briefly covered already in the previous module, this can give some useful insights for higher dimensional data as you can transform it to three or two dimensional plots. The main idea of dimensionality reduction methods is that you want to reduce the number of features or dimensions of your input data while maintaining as much information as possible. Imagine you have data that is described using 500 different numeric attributes. This means that each data point will have a dimensionality of 500, or in other words, 500 features. For some algorithms, this could lead to rather high computational effort, or those 500 features could include a lot of noisy information that is not helpful for our task. Dimensionality reduction methods will then try to reduce the dimensionality of the data points. This is commonly done in a way that tries to minimize information loss. As you can probably imagine, going from 500 to 100 dimensions potentially loses less information than going from 500 to 5 dimensions. This information loss, however, is dependent on the task that you want to perform, for example, data visualization, data compression, building recommender systems, and so on. This means that the number of new dimensions can also be seen as some sort of hyperparameter. There are plenty of other algorithms in unsupervised learning. For example, some are used to generate new data points based on your data set. Those models are called generative models, and their main objective is to approximate the distribution of the real data. This module introduced the fundamental concept only. You will learn more about clustering and dimensionality reduction in a later module. Instead, we will now continue with other important concepts such as risk and generalization.